the first half, I'll talk about Hartree-Fock theory, uh, sort of as the starting point of, let's say, traditional many-body theories for tackling electronic structure problems. Then I'll talk about DFT. I have a bunch of stuff on advanced issues in DFT, which I probably won't get to, given the time. Uh, and yes, there will be any, anything that I say that is mathematically rigorous will be an accident. Uh, and uh, Zhang Feng Lu, later this morning, will tidy all that stuff up for us, right? Uh, so I'm not trying to be rigorous at all. Um, okay, so a, ba a basic problem is electronic structure. Uh, and I'm going to limit myself to the non-relativistic case, make the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. I won't have external magnetic fields. And we'll use this term first principles, meaning that we take the Hamiltonian and we try to sort of solve it directly. We don't use model Hamiltonians. Uh, and another term that people in this game use is ab initio which we should try to avoid because it means different things to different people. So as I talk, I'll be talking both about molecular calculations that are more common in chemistry and also materials calculations, more common in material science and condensed matter physics. And the com two communities tend to use very different codes. These days there are some that cross the boundaries and they use different language. So in, in quantum chemistry, ab initio essentially means everything except density functional theory. And in solid state physics, ab initio usually means density functional theory. Uh, and my quantum chemistry friends don't believe me when I tell them there is a code called ab init, and all it does is DFT calculations. They just don't understand how that can be. Okay, so first principles is sort of what we'll use. So the idea is, uh, oh, my, uh, my clicker has sort of gotten sanded or something over the last two years, right? There's, there's, there's bits of grit in it. Okay, so uh, the simplest problem you can think of is H2, the H2 molecule, and uh, we take the the nuclei as classical, uh, we choose a separation between them and we want to find the lowest energy state, the ground state of the electrons. And if we do that, we can calculate the energy as a function of separation, calculate this binding energy curve. And uh, because at room temperature, the electrons are essentially in their ground state, once we have that curve, we can calculate lots of properties. Uh, for example, we can calculate this, the, the equilibrium uh, bond length of H2. We can calculate the energy need to, to pull it apart, the dissociation energy, and even the vibrational frequency. So there's a huge amount of information you can get out once you can solve this problem uh, sufficiently accurately. Now, you know, you won't get any prizes for doing it for H2. That was done circa 1969. Uh, but what you want to do is be able to do this for things that are a little bigger. Uh, so, so the ground state energy dominates uh, a lot of work uh, for this reason, because it really tells you a lot of the most basic properties of materials. Uh, bond lengths for molecules, lattice parameters for uh, solids, uh, vibrational frequencies, phonons, uh, reaction rates via transition state barriers. So in Organic chemistry, when you're designing drugs, what's really important is the speed of the reaction and which, uh, which way a reaction goes. You need to be able to sort of calculate that so as to be able to figure out how to make a drug. If you make a mistake, even a small mistake of what's called chemical accuracy, one kilocalorie per mole. So one kilocalorie per mole is about a 20th of an electron volt. Uh, or 1.6 milli Uh You make a very tiny mistake in that and it changes the rate of reaction by a factor of five. And if you're thinking about, you know, how quickly that drug gets into your system, uh, a factor of five uh, could make a big difference. Uh, so it's vital in chemistry. So the ground state energy is vital in chemistry because 
you need to know who is bonded to who, uh, and, and almost all the time you need to know how strongly. Uh, and especially for weakly correlated material, this is becoming increasingly important because these days people can make such a vast array of materials uh, that uh, you know, your intuition fails when uh, things get very complicated. On the other hand, if you're from condensed matter physics, uh, people more often care about the response of the system with, say, electrons or light uh, and, and how the system responds rather than so much the, the actual ground state energy. So actually, let me get a sense of the room. How many people here are primarily in math? Or math people, raise your hands. So maybe a third. Uh, how many people are in physics? A uh, few less. Uh, chemistry? Oh, quite a bunch of chemists. And what the, what the hell do the rest of you do? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Okay, so, so this first principles idea, right? We want to take the rules of quantum mechanics uh, and apply them uh, and start from the actual Hamiltonian of these electrons. Uh, so, so what does that consist of? It consists of a kinetic energy piece, so I'm going to use atomic units throughout. Uh, this is the kinetic energy. This is the electron-electron repulsion. And this is what we call the one-body piece. Uh, so, so, the, so for, if we have n electrons, uh, there's n del squareds there. Uh, because the electrons re repel each other with a Coulomb repulsion, you have a sum of pairs of this guy here, and this half avoids double counting. And then the only difference between all the different systems is this one-body potential. Uh, so, for example, for, uh, let's think of a, mo a molecule, So, yes, as I was saying, the only difference between things is the one-body potential, which can be characterized by the uh, nuclear charges, those Z alpha and R alpha, the positions of the uh, nuclei. So all the different systems just have different uh, uh, Vs. The T and the VEE are the same always. And in quantum mechanics, I hope you've all heard of quantum mechanics, uh, you, th you can think of solving the Schrodinger equation, right, for the, uh, which is an eigenvalue equation, h times psi equals e times psi there on the bottom. Or equivalently, if you're looking for the lowest energy state, you can use the variational principle, or actually you can use it for any stationary state, and minimize over allowed wave functions uh, to get the ground state energy. So the Hartree-Fock approximation, uh, is one of the earliest ones, about 1935, I guess, it was first written down. Uh, so you assume the wave function is a single Slater determinant of occupied orbitals, in the simplest case. Uh, and it satisfies, that means it satisfies Pauli exclusion. So you write the wave function, as I'll show you in a minute, as a Slater determinant of orbitals. You then minimize the energy, requiring the uh, orbitals to be orthonormal, uh, and that gives you these self-consistent Hartree-Fock equations, which I'll show you on the next slide. And then you solve them, you go round and round until things stop changing, uh, and this is a good way of doing this minimization very often, and then you rebuild the interacting energy, the actual energy, from the orbitals and the eigenvalues. And this is called Hartree-Fock theory, Hartree-Fock equations, self-consistent field theory, molecular orbital theory. Uh, if you look in your library, I don't know how many people have ever gone into a library in the last couple of years, uh, but if you go to the physical library, and they'll have put away these books, but if you ask for them, they can come back out. From about 1960 to about 1990, you'll see lots and lots of books on molecular orbital theory. All of chemistry was un is understood in terms of molecular orbital theory, which is the shape of the molecular orbitals that come out of the Hartree-Fock equations, or at least it was at that time. So people will talk about the HOMO, the highest occupied molecular orbital, the LUMO, the lowest unoccupied one, and these are the frontier orbitals, and with 
sort of pictures of these, you can understand a vast amount of chemistry, and that's how people do it. Is everything very basic so far? Everybody thinks this is boring and like, like we've seen this a million times, or is this new? Is there anyone here that this is new to? No. Or they're not admitting it if it is. So here, so I have this uh, online book, The ABC of DFT. Now this is all a little small, right? Uh, but you can look these things up anywhere, right? But this is the Slater determinant, I'm afraid. Uh, to point with this guy. Uh, the Slater determinant there is on the left, and all you do is you feed in a Slater determinant into the expectation values of your Hamiltonian pieces, and the electron-electron repulsion gives you two contributions, the Hartree energy and the exchange energy. So there's two contributions because there's two ways you can have this expectation value not vanish, one where the orbitals are the same, uh, uh, and then one where the i and j are swapped, which gives you the, what's called the exchange, which enforces the exclusion principle. Uh, and when you do, if you just ask, for, you know, what set of orbitals will minimize that energy, you get the Hartree-Fock equations. And as I said, they're self-consistent because these guys, this guy and this guy, depend on uh, the orbitals themselves, and this guy here is an orbital dependent uh, operator. Uh, uh, so uh, each orbital has its own uh, separate value for this, this, this piece here. So, so because it depends on the orbitals, you make an initial guess, you, you uh, calculate uh, the potentials, you then solve this and get some new orbitals. Often you mix them in with the old orbitals and then step and step and step, and you have con convergence criteria, usually in terms of how the orbitals are changing and whether or not the energy has settled down. Uh, and then you, you believe you found the, the minimum solution. Okay, now to do this, right, for each, each community has its own way of, of choosing single particle basis sets. So you write down those orbitals, you want to give it to a computer, you most often have a basis set. Uh, so LCAO means linear combination of atomic orbitals. Most of the chemistry packages uh, use that, uh, and these days they mostly use Gaussians. Uh, not because they're the best representation of the orbitals, but they are uh, the most convenient and can be very efficient. Uh, in the old days, people used Slater-type orbitals, which means they have an exponential decay from the, uh, the uh, nucleus, but then uh, you have this great feature that, you know, uh, you integ integrate a, f a few Gaussians together and you get more Gaussians, whereas you, with these guys you have to do it numerically. Uh, now, the most common thing that people use in periodic and materials calculations are plane waves and variations on them uh, for periodic codes, uh, but there are also many other uh, methods people use in doing calculations. Uh, so, so you have to take the orbitals, express them in some given basis set, uh, and then when you go to solve your self-consistent equations, you know, uh, to get all the parts that go in there, it's just sort of linear algebra, you do these integrals, and then, and then you have a diagonalizing problem. To, uh, for the eigenvalue problem. Okay. Uh, and Hartree-Fock often gets 99% of the total energy accurately. Uh, the remainder is called the correlation energy, and it's defined as the difference between the true energy and the Hartree-Fock energy. Uh, and because of the variational principle, it can never be positive. But an important thing to understand is Hartree-Fock is terrible for most energy differences. Uh, Hartree-Fock undermines most molecules by a vast amount, which you wouldn't necessarily know from uh, the sort of textbooks. Uh, there are a few things that it does well, but almost everything it does badly. It's not great for bond lengths, and it substantially underestimates vibrational frequencies. So, so now, how can, how can this be true and, and, and this be true? It's because 
The electronic energy is huge. Uh, I was thinking for something like sodium-2, it's probably about 150 Hartree's, and then the correlation energy would be of the order, or the bond energy would be the or, on the order of one electron volt. So it's a tiny fraction of the total energy, and bond energies, you know, half of them, half of the contribution might be the correlation energy. And, and only energy differences matter, nothing else. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so Hartree-Fock is not good uh, that way, and essentially nobody uses it anymore for, for realistic calculations. Uh, and now another major problem with Hartree-Fock is this idea that it's a single uh, determinant theory. So if you wanted to calculate that binding energy curve that I showed you at the start, uh, as you stretch, uh, as you pull the two hydrogens apart, uh, the gap between the, the lowest line state is a singlet. The gap with the triplet state, the first excitation gets very small. And in fact, in, it was shown long ago by Heitler in London that the exact wave function in the limit of pulling them apart is a 50-50 combination of two Slater determinants. So uh, your Hartree-Fock doesn't get that right. So and you have two choices. You can restrict the Hartree-Fock, which means you require it to have the correct spin symmetry, but when you pull the two hydrogen atoms apart, it will go to the wrong limit. It will be too high. It'll be two uh, separate hydrogen atoms, each though with a half and up and half a down electron, whereas unrestricted Hartree-Fock, allowing it to break spin symmetry, will get you the right energy in this limit. It will give you an up electron on one side and a down electron on the other, but the wrong spin densities. And so this has been at the heart of a lot of trouble in electronic structure since about 1940. Uh, uh, this fundamental problem that uh, as electrons localize on individual sites, uh, a single Slater determinant theory goes wrong. So for decades, there were people who would try to start uh, do sort of reson what was called, resonating valence bond theory, uh, where you sort of include extra Slater determinants, but it is very hard to get it uh, to work as a black box tool. And in the end, single Slater determinant methods sort of won the race. Uh, so the reason we care about Hartree-Fock Having said that it's, it's really bad for doing electronic structure calculations, uh, it's the starting point of almost all more sophisticated wave function techniques. Uh, so you start from, uh, you solve the Hartree-Fock problem, and then each, uh, each occupation of the Slater determinant of the Hartree-Fock is called a configuration, and you label excitations by the, uh, states by the number of excitations, and full CI configuration interaction is including as many excitations as you need to converge. Uh, and, uh, but, but actually, you know, very rarely, no, no sort of working uh, quantum chemist does that anymore. Uh, the standard method that people use is couple cluster singles and doubles and perturbative triples. Uh, and there's also a, a, list, a range of uh, perturbation theory, second order, fourth order. And then when you get to complicated systems that are called multi-reference, where there are, you do need several Slater determinants uh, to get even close to right, there's something that's more expensive, the complete active space uh, method, where you minimize both the amounts and the orbitals simultaneously in the limited subspace. And I guess we're going to hear this afternoon uh, a bit about, so ab initio quantum chemistry, even in the title, right? So this, uh, since it's quantum chemistry, almost certainly means not DFT, but I'm not sure. Uh, uh, okay, so yes, yeah, so lots of the standard methods in quantum chemistry uh, uh, start from Hartree-Fock. So couple, this thing here will normally get you to within one kilocalorie per mole uh, for many standard systems. We're also going to hear a lot this week about quantum Monte Carlo. Uh, 
And there, you're, you, again, you almost always start from a Hartree-Fock wave function, but you build a more sophisticated one, and you use Monte Carlo to estimate the parameters in that wave function. That's variational. QMC, and uh, especially on Wednesday, and then on Thursday, there's a lot about that. Uh, now, it's, it, but quantum Monte Carlo is used quite a bit in condensed matter. It's used in warm, dense matter, which is sort of uh, usually solids, but at higher temperatures, say anywhere between 30,000 and a million degrees, uh, where the chemistry is still important, uh, so it isn't in a full sort of plasma state. Uh, and there people use uh, Monte Carlo a lot. Uh, and also in quantum dynamics, not, not for the electronic structure, uh, people use Monte Carlo uh, uh, there too. Okay, so, uh, yeah, okay, so that's QMC, but there's lots of people here who know much more about it than I do. And we'll have a week on that, I guess, later in the program. Okay, the other basic method uh, we'll hear about are Green's function approaches. So, so on the one hand, right, you, so I, I call in all of these traditional methods. On the one hand, right, you're trying to find the wave function in some form or another. You can use the variational principle uh, to help you. Uh, that's one approach. The other approach to the sort of quantum many-body problem is in terms of Green's functions, which is sort of the natural thing that comes from, uh, from field theory. Uh, and also, it, and, and part of the reason, especially physicists use this, is because they're interested in the response of the system, not just in the ground state energy. Uh, so, so, and they, again, they almost all start from uh, uh, the uh, Hartree-Fock approximation for the Green's function. And, you know, you can write down the equations uh, Hedin's equations for the Green's function, and if you put in the exact vertex and so forth, you would get the exact many-body's green, many body Green's function. But uh, you know, so the, these equations, in principle, will couple to higher and higher order objects, uh, but you always truncate them, and so then you're sort of not looking directly at the wave function; you're looking at the this hierarchy of response functions. And for weakly correlated systems. Uh, People often do some flavor of GW, uh, and one thing that that's very good at is often giving you good gaps of materials. And uh, I think I saw Dominica's Gid will give a talk about Green's function methods, uh, I bet. Uh, and Michael Lindsay will talk about that too on Thursday. So, so these are sort of what happens for weakly, cor so weakly correlated systems. It, so most of chemistry is weakly correlated. Uh, uh, for most molecules at equilibrium bond lengths, uh, they, they are what we would call weakly correlated systems. When you stretch the bonds and pull them apart, then they become more strongly correlated. But for materials, sort of, let's say the materials world, about half of it is divided into weakly correlated systems, and then there are lots of people who work on strongly correlated systems where many of these methods have problems. Uh, so there are methods called dynamical mean field theory, uh, and a poor man's version is DFT plus U uh, of dynamical mean field theory, and these are where certainly DFT has issues, and uh, Often people will then turn to simpler uh, calculations. They will use a lattice, uh, some sort of lattice model to describe the system because there's some strong correlation going on that a lot of these methods uh, fail for. Uh, and a good, uh, a good reference for materials is Richard Martin's Electronic Structure book. Uh, and there's a great uh, opening chapter giving you a lot about sort of modern electronic structure calculations. And then there was a nice follow-up with Lucia Reining and David Sepperly. He'll give a talk tomorrow on the quantum Monte Carlo. And this one here in particular compares the different methods, sort of DFT, GW, and QMC. Uh, okay, so that's my quick 
overview of Hartree Falk. Christian, had you seen me do that one before? What you did so far? Yeah. Not everything, no. Yeah, good. Okay. So here's an uh, intro material, right, uh, from Lucas Wagner. If you know the other Lucas Wagner, this is not them. Uh, Lucas was a student of mine about 10 years ago. Uh, and there's DFT in a nutshell, which is just sort of eight pages, but you can be from any background. Uh, and then also there's lots of video, uh, what's it called? Teaching the theory in density functional theory on YouTube, uh, where I got together a lot of the people who pioneered density functional theory uh, because they were getting kind of old, you know, and so they may not last much longer. Uh, so I got them while I could. Okay. So DFT actually starts with Thomas Fermi theory, 1927. Uh, so both of them, Thomas and Fermi, independently wrote down the same theory based on the density. Uh, and actually, I can see I've mi mixed up my symbols. Sometimes I use N of R, sometimes I use rho of R. Sorry about that. Uh, where you write down approximate functionals of the density. This is for the kinetic energy and the Hartree energy, and you, you uh, then minimize with respect to the density. And amazingly, you get a very good answers, and well, of the order of 10%. Uh, remember, our Hartree Fock was within 1%, uh, but uh, Edward Teller proved that in this theory, molecules don't bind which really makes it hard to get a job in a chemistry department. Uh, so, uh, this all, so, but uh, amazingly, this theory was what was used for sort of all materials calculations until about 1950. So it, it, it had a very good run. Uh, and then Slater started coming along and, and doing essentially what, our, what we now call cone sham calculations. Okay, so then this gets modernized, 1964, the homberg cohn theorems. So the first one says there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between a ground state density and the potential. This is for non-degenerate cases. The second one says there's this part of the functional that is independent of V, of the particular problem you're looking at. And then uh, the third part says you can minimize uh, this F, plus V uh, overall densities uh, in order to find your ground state energy. So nowadays we talk about the constraint search formulation, which is much uh, more constructive. So if you just start from the variational principle, you write it in two steps. You minimize overall wave functions yielding a certain density and then minimize overall densities. But by doing that, by burying all the complications of the quantum many-body problem inside this F, you end up with an exact, in principle, exact statement where you only have to minimize over densities and not over wave functions, uh, over a much simpler object. And this, of course, me, you know, one important corollary was it said that Thomas Fermi theory was just a crude approximation to this formally exact theory, which contains almost no information. Uh, and what made it useful was the cohn cham equations in 1965, where you imagine a fictitious set of non-interacting electrons that have the same ground state density, that's the single particle density, as your real system. And when you do that, you, you write down what Schrodinger equation uh, they would satisfy, and you define the cone champ potential to yield the exact ground state density. And then you write this functional in terms of things that you can extract from these orbitals, the cone champ kinetic energy, the Hartree energy, and something called the exchange correlation. And when you do that, you can prove uh, that the potential you need in these equations is just the functional derivative of this EXC. The piece that you're missing is just that. Uh, and here on the right is the helium atom that I always show. This is the exact ground state density. This is the, the true potential that it feels, and this red line is the exact cone sham potential. So as long as it exists, every electronic system has an exact cone sham potential from which you can 
uh, deduce the exact ground state density. And if you knew this functional exactly, uh, you get the exact uh, result without ever looking at the wave function. And today's basic exchange correlation approximations, local density approximation is simple integral over the density, just like we saw in Thomas Fermi. Uh, the generalized gradient approximation uses a function of both the density and its gradient. Uh, and then hybrids mix some Hartree-Fock exchange uh, with your GGA. Uh, so these are the three sort of basic forms, and there are many, many variations uh, these days uh, that you, but almost all of them start from one, one of these, one or another of these. Uh, and what an important feature here, going from the Thomas Fermi theory to the cone sham, is that you're only approximating a very small fraction of the total exchange, uh, of the total energy. So even if you sort of don't do a great job on that, it'll still give you pretty decent energetics. Uh, the local density approximation was written by Cohn and Sham in 65. It still is not accurate enough for chemistry. It overbinds bonds by about one electron volt. And then it was the advent of the GGA and the hybrids which made DFT competitive within chemistry. Uh, it's still not as accurate as you would like. It's not as good as couple cluster. And these days, typical errors would be two or three kilocalories per mole, whereas quantum chemists would really like to have errors for strong bonds be below one kilocal per mole. Uh, okay, but the cost is great. Uh, I mean, it's a great deal, right? So. With a GGA, the cone sham is cheaper than Hartree Fock. It scales as the number cubed, whereas couple cluster scales as the number seventh, uh, to the seventh. So uh, you can spend a week doing 20 atoms with a couple cluster on a, a moderate uh, cluster in a different sense of the word, right? Uh, uh, whereas you can do a DFT calculation 10 times as big on your desktop in the morning. Uh, so again, couple cluster usually gives you very good answers, uh, but there it's too slow or more. You can't do systems big enough. Uh, I think I said all this. Uh, here are some examples that I tend to point out uh, to people. Uh, so this one here is from a paper about a year ago where these are the TCs of, of superconductors under pressure. And we see that the ones at the top there have hit room temperature. So people predicted that mater certain materials, uh, hydrogen sulfides, under high pressure would be very good superconductors. And this came from DFT calculations. So it was a pure prediction. And uh, now people have them going all the way up to room temperature. Uh, this is a little satellite, Juno, that orbits Jupiter goes by every 57 days and measures the gravity. And in warm, dense matter, uh, you want to look at things under high temperatures and pressures, and it's very expensive to do experiments, or you just can't do them here on the Earth. And so people use finite temperature DFT to calculate the equations of state of various things in, inside Jupiter and compare them with Juno's measurements. This is a volcano curve. Uh, this is about 20 years ago, where a bunch of Danish physicists were able to find a better catalyst for the Fritz Haber, uh, the Haber, sorry, the Haber-Bosch process. Uh, after, actually, I heard the real estimate was about 250,000 experimental attempts over a century, uh, whereas they found it using DFT calculations. This guy here is the gilt head sea bream, and it turns out that as the oceans, even if they get only slightly more acidic, the change in the pH changes the sort of equilibrium of certain molecules that it uses to smell. And so people were doing DFT calculations 
for the sense of smell of the gilt head sea bream and publishing them in the Journal of Physiology, uh, which apparently is very good physiology journal. And then this is me doing DFT uh, one morning because there was this paper, this guy I know, uh, and he, showed, he, was, he was figuring out the hardness of the water and what effect it has on the taste of your coffee and again doing DFT calculations. So, and he was mostly right. Uh, okay, but here is numbers from NERSC, uh, which runs the DOE's supercomputers. And this is three or four years ago. And DFT calculations take up more than anything else, more than climate change, right? Uh, uh, more than uh, everything. Uh, so this is their, so there's about 50,000 papers a year now are published using uh, reporting DFT results in, uh, in, you know, of fish and other things, right? Uh, is lattice QCD on the right? Uh, lattice QCD, I think running it <laughs> is, you know, is very, uh, you know, you really need your supercomputers and things, right? So it may be, uh, yes, I think its fraction is bigger than it was yeah. on the earlier one. Surprise is bigger than MD. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. And then more modern things, right? Weak interactions. How's our time? Oh, it's pretty good. Uh, we'll hear a lot about that, I'm guessing. And I probably misspelled your name, I'm just realizing. Uh, uh, Alex. Uh, uh, range separated hybrids are what are used in a lot of materials calculations. If you've done HSE 06 to get a better gap, that's a range separated hybrid. Uh, the random phase approximation, many people have been working on that, trying to get better. Uh, accuracies. Uh, meta GGAs are one step beyond GGAs. They use the kinetic energy of the cone sham equations. You may have heard of John Perdue's scan uh, functional, which is very competitive and doesn't require doing the Hartree Fock. Because these days, you know, the Hartree Fock is the most expensive part of some of these calculations. And you may have heard of a local hybrid called DM21, which came out a month or two ago from DeepMind. Uh, and these are all, you know, this is just a tiny fraction of what's out there, right? But these are all used for getting different effects uh, better and so forth. Um, this is just, yeah, the, there are a million of these things. Uh, well, now I'll, I'll get into a little more sort of specialized things. Maybe I'll stop here for some more questions from Carlos. Okay, let me sort of finish these things. So uh, if we had an accurate enough approximation to the kinetic energy, we wouldn't have to solve the Cohn-Sham equations, just like in Thomas Fermi theory. Uh, so, so there's various people uh, trying various things to uh, make orbital free DFT a reality. Uh, and many people have worked on this over the years, but there is no general purpose thing. Part of it is because this, the kinetic energy is such a big fraction of the total energy that you can't afford small mistakes. Uh, another thing is time-dependent DFT. Everything I've told you about is ground state uh, DFT, but there's an, an analogous theorem, time-dependent, uh, and you can uh, turn on a time-dependent potential, prove the runge gross theorem, which is the analog of the Homburg cone, and set up some time-dependent cone-sham equations. And if you do, just look at linear response, people get low-line optical excitations pretty good from, from this. Uh, and mo these days, almost all chemical codes will do a TDDFT calculation, and it'll only cost about 10 times as much as your ground state DFT calculation. Uh, uh, so that's how you can get some excitations out of DFT. Uh, 
Thermal DFT in warm, dense matter. I've mentioned this, and we've had programs here at IPAM about it. Uh, so the theorems generalize to equilibrium of the electrons at a finite temperature. And so uh, you, it's turned out to be very useful for uh, the systems that normally are treated sort of as classical plasmas. And so you can't get any sort of chemical detail, right? Whereas Hong Cham DFT has sort of revolutionized this over the last 15 years. Uh, on the other hand, once you get too hot, uh, you can no longer converge your cone sham calculations, and then you have to go to an orbital-free version. Common DFT failures. Uh, so it's hard to get to, get to this chemical accuracy that uh, chemists would really like uh, for molecular systems, and even harder for materials to get down to one kilocal per mole. Typically, it's much less accurate for things like transition metal complexes, <coughs> which are quite important. Uh, although, to be honest, a lot of the traditional quantum chemical methods are also less accurate there. Uh, I haven't sort of gone into it, but it fails when we take our H2 test case. Uh, if you do a modern DFT calculation for H2 and you stretch it and stretch it, it will uh, fail in just the same way as the Hartree-Fock uh, because it uses the single Slater determinant and your functional is an approximation that's locally based. It will, uh, you'll end up going to the wrong limit or breaking spin symmetry uh, and then it fails for multiple stretched bonds as I was saying. Uh, People often talk about the delocalization error these days. Uh, so the semi-local functionals are too smooth as a function of particle number. Uh, and Hartree-Fock, in fact, is too sharp. Uh, and, and you can show that you, you have straight line segments for the total energy as a function of particle number. Uh, and then, uh, I'd, well, these are little notes about scan uh, using Hartree-Fock densities. Uh, is, is turning out to be very accurate for, well, water clusters and other things. Here's the other tutorials. Okay. Uh, then I have a bunch of more advanced things, which I don't want to try to do. Uh, I'd rather try to do some questions.